Yes. Hello. Good evening, everybody. And like Stevie said, we're going to take it to higher ground. Thank you for joining us for this evening for really what I hope to be informative, helpful conversation um, about something called guaranteed basic income. I know folks are already putting in questions in the Q&A, and we look forward to addressing some of those questions. So again, I'm Supervisor Holly Mitchell, proudly representing the second Supervisorial District here in LA County. And I want to welcome you to our virtual community discussion on, again, guaranteed basic income. So thank you all for carving out a little time to join with us tonight. We've got a great panel, and I think we'll have a great informative conversation, and I hope we all learn a little something new. For some of you, this may be your first time hearing this term, guaranteed basic income, or maybe you're here to build on what your knowledge of the concept already is. Regardless, my team and I appreciate your willingness to spend some time to talk about it. Um, to really figure out ways in which we can come together as a community to talk about how we infuse new energy and creativity and new programming ideas into our economic recovery as a county, acknowledging that various communities were hit differently by this current public health and economic pandemic. So, you know, before we get to our really amazing panel who are the true experts who are going to talk to you about their experience with guaranteed basic income, I want to share a little bit about what GBI is and the goals for tonight's conversation. You know, I'm new to the county, but not new to the game of public policy making. You know, I spent 10 years in the legislature, had the pleasure of leading Crystal Stairs for another nine years. And then before that, worked for various nonprofit organizations as well as was staffed in the legislature. So I spent really my entire professional career thinking about the role of government in alleviating poverty, particularly multi-generational poverty. And I've always questioned what we should be doing differently. When I look back on a number of the uh, government-sponsored entitlement programs that are supposed to support families, Cal Works, subsidized child care, the kinds of programs the government is designed to help keep families together and help keep children out of poverty. You know, I've really looked over the years at what works, what does it, and what messages are we sending low-income working families in terms of how these programs are designed? We really ask people to jump through enormous hoops to validate need and really from my perspective have shown them huge disrespect. And so I was really proud to this past May join with my colleague, um, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl and introduce and have passed a motion to create an initiative at the county level to really look in a meaningful new way at poverty disruption. And one of the programs we intend to implement to really talk about how we change the trajectory for families who have lived in poverty is through this guaranteed basic income. I am thrilled that because of a, 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 the, the health of our uh, government general fund, thanks for support, thanks to support from the federal government and state government, several cities within LA County are also launching general basic income programs, including the city of LA, Compton, whose program you'll hear about shortly, uh, Long Beach and West Hollywood. And now we will have one that cuts, cuts across all of LA County. It's really important to note that the idea of empowering our most vulnerable residents to make the best decision for their lives and families is not a new concept. Uh, in Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign in the late 60s, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. discussed the benefits of unconditional cash payments as an effective method to alleviate poverty. Let me be clear, you know, much like with CalWORKs today, people have to work uh, in the CalWORKs program. And we are clear that this program isn't about replacing work. That's not the point at all. It is fundamentally about acknowledging what it costs to live and take care of your family and afford rent in Los Angeles, and acknowledging the fact that far too many people who go to work every day still don't earn enough to be able to do that. That's where we hope this program comes in. In just a moment, we're gonna hear from a representative that worked with Mayor Michael Tubbs from Stockton to create the first GBI program in the state and the lessons we learned from their impact. Again, 
our goal tonight is to really open a discussion as an introduction about what GBI can be and should be for the county and its potential impact and how it can positively change the trajectory of at least a thousand and hopefully many more families across LA County. The GBA pilot my office is working on hasn't started yet. We just passed the resolution in May and we're in the very beginning stages of developing who we will serve through our GBI program. Uh, we'll be uh, working with the team to ensure that we have the resources in place, we have researchers in place to really make sure that we are tracking the impact and the outcomes of this pilot. So your questions and input tonight are helping to inform this pilot program. So please use the Q&A feature to share any questions you have or comments. This is the beginning of an ongoing discussion we plan to have with you as the implementation process unfolds. So thank you again for taking the time to perhaps learn something new or share your perspective on guaranteed basic income. I've got a great group of amazing women actually, fancy that, who are the cutting edge experts who are living the reality of guaranteed basic income every day. And I'm really thrilled that they're carving out some time to join us tonight. Suki Samra, the director of Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. She was a former policy aide to Mayor Michael Tubbs, who spearheaded the nation's first program. She now heads up the national coalition of mayors across the country supporting the initiative. We're also joined by the co-director of the Compton Pledge, Jamara Hayner. Uh, Jamara um, is a 15-year veteran of communications and community outreach in both the public and private sectors. And the Compton Pledge is a guaranteed income pilot program which launched in December of 2020. Also part of the Compton Pledge program is a participant, a participant who I saw on a wonderful segment on Spectrum One, I believe, she'll verify if that was her or not, talking about her exper experience and that's Kaisha McCann. Kaisha is a mother living in Compton for over eight years. And again, tonight, she's going to share her experience as a recipient of the Compton Pledge program. Finally, we have the birthday girl. Erin, thank you for spending your birthday evening with us. Erin Elizabeth uh, Coltrera, who's the lead researcher and program officer at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for a Guaranteed Income Research Program. She was part of the research team that evaluated Stockton's program after their first year of implementation. So thanks everybody for joining us. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, I see you again. Thank you so much for joining. Let's get started. Um, Suki, my first question is gonna be with you. SEED was the acronym for the Stockton program, Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. So can you give us a real quick high level overview of the program and the community impact that you um, achieved from the very beginning? Sure, and thank you um, for having all of us here today to talk about guaranteed income. So SEED, as you said, stood for the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. We were the nation's first mayor-led guaranteed income demonstration launched back in October of 2017, so a couple of years ago, and we gave 125 randomly selected Stocktonians $500 per month uh, for 24 months. So disbursements are over now, um, and we'll touch a little bit on sort of the data that we've seen in the next question. But in terms of the impact that we hoped and that we saw, of course, the immediate impact that we wanted was for the 125 people who are receiving the dollars um, to extend a lifeline to them and to make sure that they had an income floor of even $500 per month um, and to see what they what they would do with that and how that would change their lives. Um, but we also wanted the impact to be much larger um, and to extend beyond just 125 people we were serving and beyond just Stockton. And we really wanted to start a conversation nationally um, and in the state of California about what it means when an economy isn't working for everyone. Even prior to COVID, we knew that folks were working two or three jobs and struggling to make ends meet. So we really wanted to start a conversation around that and how, what kinds of policies can we put in place to make sure that everyone's thriving in the richest country in the world? Based on your experience, um, and you know, where I, I was thrilled to hear about the launch and to watch it, um, what stood out for you? What, what was your most significant takeaway uh, um, as you guys launched the pilot? Yeah, in terms of the most significant sort of takeaway and what came from it, I think it was definitely the employment data that we saw. And that's because not because I went going into it, assumed that people were going to be lazy or that poor people that poor people are lazy by their own choices, but because that was the number one criticism we received. And I think we're seeing that now in national conversations around unemployment insurance and like the economy opening back up. 
But this just this assumption that if you give people money, if you support them, they're going to stop working, they're not going to, they're just going to drop out of the economy. And in fact, we saw the reverse happen in Stockton. Uh, people who received the $500 per month were two times as likely to go from part-time to full-time employment than were people who didn't receive the $500 per month. So again, people were working more, not less. And so that was um, that was great to, great to see, great to validate what we had been saying for so many years and just really speaks to um, the, the tenacity and resilience of our people. And that issue about the part-time to full-time employment, dig a little deeper in that. You know, why is that significant? That people may not get the significance. So talk about that briefly. Yeah, so what we saw was that, again, folks were folks were receiving the $500 per month um, were almost twice as likely to, to gain, go from part-time to full-time employment. And that's the reason that that happened because of the $500 per month um, is because people were finally able to take time off to go to an interview. Um, if you're working like wage labor, if you're working at a restaurant or if you're working anything that's like minimum wage that doesn't have benefits like pay time off, it's really, really hard to take time off. Um, and if you do have to take time off, then you lose that money. And if you're counting every dollar to go towards your bills, it's just, you, you just don't have the luxury of being able to interview for a job. We also saw people who were able to do unpaid internships that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And so really being able to take a chance on themselves um, and folks are really just able to dream bigger for themselves. And that in turn had lots of consequences um, for other data where we saw that folks were happier and less stressed and less anxious. Um, they reported less uh, physical and bodily pain. And so we're really just seeing the ways in which something as small as $500 per month really allowed people to achieve their full potential, both in terms of their mental health and in terms of like the job that they were pursuing and their physical health. That's powerful. That's powerful. Jamara, so the Compton Pledge, um, give us an overview um, of the Compton Pledge program and why the city of Compton, you think, decided to launch this program. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Supervisor. We had the tremendous good fortune to follow Suki and Mayor Tubbs and everyone in Stockton doing this amazing thing. Um, so we launched the Compton Pledge um, this past December and then continued enrolling through March. We've got 800 families receiving between three and $600 a month based on how many dependents they have, right? If you've got a couple of kids, your cost of living is going to be a bit higher. Um, so we got the tremendous benefit of getting to, you know, learn and continue this evolution of guaranteed income. For Compton, Compton's such an amazing city with so many tremendous assets, cultural, entrepreneurial, so many things, but there's also such a tremendous amount of economic stress. And we really focused on that stress and not for nothing, we started in the middle of the pandemic, right? So all of us, every one of us here tonight are experiencing more stress than we probably ever have throughout our lives. What we're also seeing though, um, is that we now have maybe more visibility into what poverty looks like for our neighbors, one block mm -hmm. over, one community over, that we had not really been aware of sometimes before for some people, right? So now when we are seeing mass evictions and other things, we can start to see what other people have actually been living with, not just within this pandemic, but you know, for years and decades for communities and families. So we focused on kind of a mindset of being able to allow people to breathe and then build and also do the same mm. thing at the same time, right? So breathing is that stress that Suki was talking about that we've got amazing research data for. But what it really looks like is if you are rushing to get to your first day of work because you got that new job and you're so excited and your car breaks down because you weren't able to afford maintenance because you didn't have that $250 to pay for it. That's a reality, right? So as we're talking about jobs, that's what it feels like. Or your kid got sick and you don't have $50 to pay for childcare, any number of other things. So it's really diving into that lived reality of the stresses just on a day-to-day, week-to-week level that a lot of people all over Los Angeles County live with all of the time and now more so. So all, people, it's all the time. And, the, you know, as America, we are very good at hiding poverty and making that invisible. We don't love to talk about it, but it is a reality for so much of us. So being able to breathe and then when you're able to just get to work, not maybe have to work that third shift, right, on whatever you're doing or be able to be home when your kids get home from school, to have that stability during the pandemic then allows you to think, okay, what's next for me, right? Whether that's what's next, can I afford to stay in this apartment and therefore the school district when my kids start school in the fall? Or what about five years from now if I want to start saving for a home? So you've got to be able to just breathe first and then start to build. So that's kind of the mental framework we brought to it. It's just been an amazing experience. I love that concept of breathe and build. One more quick follow-up question. Like I asked Suki, so far in the program, what's surprised you the most or been your most, your biggest takeaway? 
I think for me, the biggest takeaway has been the pride that everyone has, in Compton has felt because of this, even the people that aren't participants, right? That was a fear. We don't have, you know, we're privately funded, no taxpayer money. We didn't have money for everybody. Is that going to be hard when your neighbor down the street or someone in your church or on your, you know, basketball team is receiving this and you're not? But what we saw was a tremendous amount of pride and a community spirit because we started with the community. We were centered there to say it may not be me, but it might be my cousin. Maybe it's my sister who now doesn't have to sleep at my place because she can afford her own rent. So it's not just an individual experience. Actually, the entire community experiences poverty, but also the empowerment on the other side. So that was just a wonderful thing to be able to see and actually feel that. Aisha, when she talked about breathe and build, I have to tell you, I was reminded of an experience I had once when I was the CEO of Crystal Stairs. And it was a Saturday, I think, child care provider training. And, you know, I'm a single working mom. So I showed up to the training in my team mom jersey. I can't even remember which T-ball team Ryan, my son, was playing on at the time. And I, and I apologize. Excuse me, everybody. But it's Saturday. I'm doing mom duties. And I'll never forget this mother who came up to me, who was a recipient of Crystal Stairs child care um, subsidy and said, you know, I've never had the resources to allow my sons to play um, in sports like that. And the sons were standing right there and I will never forget that look in their eye. And I thought that's true, that, that government programs are you know, designed really to provide the barest of minimum. And the program I was running, the largest subsidized childcare you know, organization in the country at the time, we were providing for childcare, but every child should have the right to tutoring or some kind of after-school program or summer enrichment program. And, you know, for boys and girls to have the opportunity to play on a little league team or Pop Warner or whatever the case is, how that is such a critical part of really kind of our human development and growth and building community. So breathe and build just reminded me of that story. So tell us what being a program participant has meant to you. Has it allowed you to breathe and build? And what does that look like? Yes, most, most definitely. Um, I will say regarding breathing, I am breathing amazing now. Um, it has definitely allevi alleviated a lot of stress. Um, of course, with the pandemic, a lot of things were shut down, including work. Um, so there was a point in time where there wasn't anything coming in, there wasn't a savings, um, and it literally came at the perfect time, um, especially with me being a new mother. Um, I didn't realize how expensive diapers were or formula. Yeah. yeah, you know, people tell you, but once you actually have to pay for those things, it really takes a ding in your pocket, especially when you don't have that extra income. Um, so when I found out that I was a recipient um, of the Compton Pledge, it literally came at the most perfect time. Um, so I have been able to breathe a lot better, but also when it comes to that building, one of my ultimate goals is to protect the future of my daughter or invest the future into or invest into her future. Um, and one of my biggest things is having a home from her, having a home from her. Um, so what this has allowed me to do besides, you know, give me the extra funds to buy those diapers or, um, you know, get that formula. It has also helped me with saving money to eventually become a homeowner of my own. So um, it, it definitely has been such a big help and, and I'm just grateful to be such a member of this amazing program. And I'm so glad you are because, you know, home ownership is such a critical um, measurement of, of how we stabilize communities and transition and pull people out of poverty. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I have every confidence that you will make it happen. You. Did you have any hesitation? Was there any concern when you heard about this Compton Pledge, even though it came at the right time in the middle of the pandemic? What did you really think when you got the call? That's because the first thing I thought was this is a scam um, because I randomly it was like literally out of nowhere I got a text message and I'm like well, like who is texting me how did I get my number and telling me I'm winning some money or I'm not winning but you know um, mm -hmm. I'm a participant of a program that I knew I never signed up for um, so I was immediately hesitant um, but then I saw I got an email on top of the text message and I was thinking okay these scammers they're really going above and beyond to get me to sign up for this program <laughs> um, but I did reach out to um, a family member of mine, which is actually my boyfriend's um, father, and he's very much so involved in the city of Compton. And he actually is the one who um, reassured me that, hey, no, this is a, a, a definite program. Congratulations. If you are a recipient, you should look more into it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's definitely legit. Um, 
even though I took his word, I still was a little bit more hesitant. So I actually responded to the email um, and two members, um, I believe it's Nika and Daphne. Um, and it was literally like, I wanna say like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, so I'm like, no one's gonna respond back to me, but literally not even 15 minutes passed, back, passed by and they responded to me saying, no, this is legit, congratulations. Um, you know, reassuring me and giving me some information about the program. But yes, I was definitely hesitant, especially with a lot of scams and everything going on. <laughs> Kaisha, were, were you on the Spectrum News piece I saw on the program? I, was, I yeah. thought that was you. I thought that was you. Yeah, yeah. I've, become, I've have become a true champion of the Compton Pledge. Literally anyone who I'm speaking to, I'm talking about it. Um, I'm always like going on their social media, liking their posts. I'm sharing their posts. So yeah, I, anytime to speak about it, I, I'm available. <laughs> and Supervisor, if I can just say, we were so sure that, that was going to happen because there are smart people out there like Keisha that know about scams, know about everything else. So we started with a really strong community advisory council of faith leaders, education leaders, library, everything. So that ideally you just be a couple degrees removed to say, let me call someone I trust to say, is this real? If some of the families, you know, if the documentation status concerns or something. So we really wanted to start there. So those phone calls could happen. And then again, if you've got a strong community and you start with community and start with credit ability that was critical so that Keisha felt safe saying yes. I agree and um, our early Zoom poll shows I'm thrilled based on the percentage of participants on the call tonight who've heard about and are familiar with the concept. So your community engagement work, the Spectrum News piece work, everybody's learning about it. That's a good thing. That's the first hurdle I think we've had to cross. Birthday girl Erin. Thank you for spending time with us tonight on your birthday. That's that's commitment. Sharon, your birthday to talk about guaranteed basic income. We appreciate you, Erin. Talk to us about the effectiveness from a researcher's perspective of basic income as a real poverty disruptor kind of strategy. You know, how was this really going to make a difference? How can it? Absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for having me, Supervisor Mitchell, uh, and the rest of your team. And there is no better place to spend my birthday than talking about guaranteed income with LA County, honestly. Uh, the work that you guys are going to do is amazing. So that's a phenomenal question. And from a research perspective, but also I'm a trained social worker. So my background is always as a social worker, right? It's always from that lived experience. And guaranteed income has the potential to be more effective than any strategy we've tried before. Our current social safety net, which you know we've all talked about, right? It's super important, but it lacks the individual flexibility of cash to fill the gaps that are left behind. And what's more, we also know that millions of Americans whose struggle is absolutely real don't even qualify for existing benefits. And you layer that onto the idea that we know that poverty and financial insecurity take a toll that isn't just economic, right? We've just heard Kaisha talking about it, Jamara referenced it, and Suki was talking about all of the impacts that um, financial insecurity can have. It impacts everything from mental to physical health, and even things like whether or not we have the bandwidth to take risks to do things that we know are going to make our lives better, right? Whether it's going back to school or applying for that new job. And it's actually that that's the key to the other enormous potential for GI as a poverty alleviation or disruption strategy, because alleviation and prevention go hand in hand. And we know right now, millions of Americans are one missed paycheck or one emergency away from missing payments on bills, or being unable to afford basic necessities or even plan for the future. Basic income has the potential to change that narrative by providing a safe and secure base on which people can build their lives. I appreciate that. I'm, um, the uh, audience has gone crazy with questions. So I was scanning the questions like, oh my God, they've got so many really powerful questions. I've got staff who are going to text me the question, text me the question. I'm not sure how we're going to keep up with all of that, but we're going to try to get as many of them answered as possible because they're really powerful questions. Um, so Aaron, so how vital is the research aspect of GBI pilots to the overarching goal of advocacy? And I, I, I don't want to leave your answer, but you know that's, I think, a critically important question. And so I want you, having done this work with a, a couple of the pilots um, all over the country, to answer that. Why is this important? Absolutely, Supervisor Mitchell. And you're not leading at all, because this is something that I believe is absolutely imperative to this work. 
um, we have an opportunity here to come together and redefine what it means to be part of our communities, right? To be mm -hmm. part of society, to say definitively that there is a higher floor that no one should fall below. But we can't do that if we don't know what works well and for who. Pilots are an incredibly important part in and of themselves because they demonstrate things like proof of concept, right? They show that programs like this can function. Research and evaluation comes into play because it's only from the data that we collect that we can figure out how to build policies that are gonna work for all of us. And that's the ultimate goal here, right? Is policies and programs that work. I agree. Here's one specific question because it really um, kind of focuses on how we have chosen to frame this pilot for LA County. And so it's a, it, it, it's, and the question is from Ben who says, if the goal is to lift people out of poverty, would it make more sense to reduce the number of recipients in favor of giving more to each? Example, $1,500 per month, say for like 24 months, to really be a game changer for them and give them the bandwidth capabilities to focus on their goals. I would also just say the county concept, um, which will make it the largest pilot in the country, is 1,000 people, $1,000 a month over three years. So Aaron, talk about, you know, every pilot is doing something different. We've heard the difference between Compton and the Stockton uh, pilot. I think Long Beach and West Hollywood are trying different um, lengths of time, amounts of money, number of, uh, of recipients. So can you talk about why that varied approach and why we think what, we've, uh, what we plan to do in LA County makes so sense for this iteration of the program? Absolutely. And that's a phenomenal question. And I think the question actually hits right at the heart of what we don't know yet, right? Which is at what funding level do we see the most return for the cost of the program? Everything is always, you know, in life about trades and balances and, you know, figuring out what is going to work and in what way, right? And I think right now we're looking at policies um, or programs all across the country that are varying, as Supervisor Mitchell was just mentioning, um, at funding levels from $350 a month to $1,000 a month. We don't yet have the data to say definitively that one funding level is better than another. So why not do $1,500? There's not necessarily a great reason not to, except that LA County has something that nobody else does right now. And that's the ability to do this for a thousand people over three years. That number of people is going to give us the best opportunity we have yet so far to take a look at exactly what GI can do for Americans of all backgrounds. I mean, that's stunning. So I think the idea is rather than go smaller with the number of people so that we can go bigger with money, we want to go big with people so that we can say, right, who does this benefit and how? And I think that is you know, sort of key to what LA County is thinking with this. Um, Esty Cohen says she sees no reason not to make employment a requirement. You keep saying that they will work. So that's great. Make it a requirement. Um, I think the reality is um, we don't anticipate that people will be able to live solely on this amount of money. The, po the point is to provide a guaranteed basic level of income to augment their income to help elevate them out of poverty. If the people don't work and they're going to get $1,000 a, a month, that's not about elevating folks out of poverty. Anybody else want to comment on that? I oh, go ahead, Saki. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, people have such especially as we've seen over the past year and a half, the world changes in ways that we cannot control. So you might be working for part of that time and then you are furloughed because it is not safe to go into work or your partner or your parent gets sick and you need to take time off to be able to care for them. So those are circumstances entirely outside of your individual control. And then trying not to compound that chaos within your family or maybe you're sick by allowing you to at least count on this so you can continue to plan ahead when life happens. I think we've all learned that over the past year and a half. So I think that's a particular bridge that also gives um, and strikes out right balance. An interesting additional question. Considering businesses are leaving LA and California in droves, I challenge that assumption, due in part to the crippling personal and corporate taxes, don't you think that lowering taxes will keep businesses, i.e. job providers in the city and state? Don't you think that more jobs available and lower corporate taxes, there will be fewer applicants for each job, which translates into higher wages, thereby reducing poverty? Who would like to take a shot at that? 
I'll jump in there from a California specific perspective. Um, I would say a couple of things. One, um, in this sector of the economy, a lot of what we're seeing are service jobs, retail jobs, right? Those are jobs that happen here. Um, a lot of those are, you know, parallel fight for um, a decent wage to actually pay your employees. We've seen that when you pay people decently, people are flocking to employers who treat their workers safely and with dignity. So those two things have to go hand in hand. Um, so it's really, you know, having an economic awareness. And I appreciate the question, understanding this doesn't happen in a vacuum. But I think what we're seeing here is for employees who also have a choice in where they are working, right? People are now more than ever choosing to work for employers that keep them safe, keep them healthy, and also pay them enough so they can live, you know, full lives. And that's what we're really seeing that affects people's employment decisions more often. I think the people, businesses that you might see leaving California, and there's tons of research to actually, um, counter counteract some of those claims um, are, are businesses that maybe are getting significant tax breaks that have a really terrible and tremendous downstream effect on the economy on exactly the people that we're talking about. Um, so for a personal income tax um, deduction that might be more favorable in another state, that's not really a decision about your company, that's just about your own personal wealth. Um, that's a choice you get to make, but your employees also have a choice of the type of environment they want to work in. Lots of questions about how the people will be uh, selected. And, and as I started saying, you know, we at LA County passed a motion saying we're going to initiate this program, the number of people for how much time and the amount of money. And a part of tonight's Zoom is to really hear about other programs that have launched ahead of us, what they have discovered, what they found. Um, and we're going to take a lot of the comments and this we're in the process of determining for LA County what that selection criteria will be. We're looking across the county. We're looking at pockets of poverty, communities that were disproportionately hit by the current economic crisis that we're facing. So you're on the very early um, um, stage of the planning process as we figure out who should be a recipient in the program. And I think you've heard, I know West Hollywood intends to um, focus on um, LGBTQ um, and seniors in their communities. Long Beach is focusing on single parents and they're gonna augment their cash benefit with other supports like uh, transportation vouchers and childcare. Um, Supervisor Solis is doing a small pilot in LA County where she's gonna focus on transitional age youth, kids that are, have been in foster care and transitioning out. So the point of, of all the pilots focusing on a different population, as Aaron said, is to really figure out um, who gets the biggest bang of, out of this kind of investment, what the duration should be, and the amount of time. There are a couple of technical questions that maybe Aaron or Suki, you all can help us out with. People are really drilling down and wanting to know the specifics. So do um, basic income recipients have to declare the amount of money they receive as taxable income? That's a great question. Sure, um, I can take that one. And Jamara, you might also have insights from the work they did in Compton. But uh, from what we did in Stockton, the guaranteed income is considered a gift because it uh, falls underneath the annual IRS limits of $15,000. So it is not taxable income. Excellent. Same here in Compton. And I think that the other part of what Suki has been doing on a national level is facilitating conversations among cities and communities so we can share that policy, research priorities, et cetera, so we can learn from what another state is doing and then federal partners as well. So that conversation, especially at this sort of laboratory stage is so critical. Suki, so briefly tell us some of the other states that are involved based on the mayors that are in your um, amazing nationwide um, alliance. Sure, we have, I think we're at 58 mayors now across 25 states. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of mayors in California, including the ones that Supervisor Mitchell just mentioned, Mayor Garcia of Long Beach, uh, Mayor Brown of Compton, Mayor Horvath of West Hollywood, we have Palm Springs, Oakland, LA, um, San Francisco. So a lot of California cities. Um, but then we also have cities as diverse as um, we have we have Alabama, we have, Georgia, we have Atlanta, Georgia, we have Gainesville, Florida, um, up the East Coast, we have, we have Madison, Wisconsin, we have uh, Providence, Rhode Island. So there's a lot of cities across a lot of states um, and all of the pilots as Supervisor Mitchell and Aaron mentioned, they differ and they vary because we're interested in understanding um, who a guaranteed income works best for and why. Wonderful. People are asking if community-based organizations will be involved um, and they will and have been. Anybody want to talk about how CBLs have been involved as you've rolled out your programs? 
Yeah, in Compton, we were lucky enough to start with a community advisory council of several dozen community leaders from our community college district and secondary schools to faith partners as well. You know, and you see involvement from boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, et cetera, um, in a couple of different ways. One, letting their members know about the program as we were starting on recruitment, and then also offering additional benefits, right? So if, or just awareness of other things that are going on. So if there's literacy, financial literacy classes happening at the Y, or the city offers something else, having that network is so incredibly helpful and also creating a sense of community. So it's not just that you are one of 800 families, but you don't see anyone else. You actually get more connected with those community organizations, whether you already knew them or don't know them. And especially for ones that serve certain populations, whether it is youth, undocumented families, whatever that is, there's that level of trust that is so critical to the success of these programs. Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. I was on Go ahead, Kaisha. I was going to speak from a participant um, standpoint regarding those resources. Um, something that I was always mentioning besides, of course, just a guaranteed income is the, the amount of resources that are also available to me, available to me besides the funds. So as she spoke on the financial literacy courses, um, the big point of this for me is to use this money to save and using that information that I was not privy to prior to being a member of the Compton Pledge, it has definitely helped me. So um, there's definitely a lot of resources besides the funds I just wanted to, to state. That's excellent. I'm glad that you did. Um, folks are asking if this Zoom can be sent via email. It's being recorded, so it'll be posted uh, on all of my social media platforms so you can take a look at it and send people to it. We're glad people are interested. And I'm glad the Q&A is coming from, a, from a, a, a variety of perspectives, people who are all about it, who've read about it, who are asking technical questions, how we're gonna select people and, and will it be enough? And people who aren't buying it, who say that there are plenty of jobs, people who say that they've got jobs, that you know they work hard and other people should work hard too. Um, um, so I'm glad that everybody's tuning in um, because my goal is to stick to the facts, to not bring a particular um, um, partisan or political orientation. And the fact of the matter is in the second supervisorial district, there are a disproportionate number of people who are living at or below poverty. And California has the highest child poverty rate in the country. And as a policymaker, I feel I have a responsibility to dig deep and figure out what are the systemic reasons that bring us to this place. Uh, Kaisha has shared beautifully about what these additional resources have allowed her to provide for her family and her child's future. We've been very clear that this is to augment Sally. We're not telling people don't work. Um, that wouldn't be a poverty alleviation program if it were. And so this is to, again, acknowledge what it really costs, what the real cost of living, what a real livable wage to survive and thrive in LA County really is. So that really is ultimately our goal. I see Ms. Scott wants to know, uh, does the GBI assist seniors who are affected by not being able to afford the increase in the park and rec fee for swimming, lap swimming in the second district? Ms. Scott, I wish you had tuned in last Tuesday and the Board of Supervisors because you would have heard me introduce a motion asking for the CEO to come back to us with a plan to cover those costs. So we have heard you, Ms. Scott, and all the seniors at Jesse Owens Pool, and we're working on it. We're doing that plus guaranteed basic income. Folks have asked, where's the money coming from? Let me just say briefly for our pilot for LA County, um, you know, the, the Federal government has uh, enacted, passed, you know, two bills that have brought amazing, much needed resources to both the state of California, the county, and municipalities. The CARES Act came first at the top of the pandemic, and now Congress passed something called the American Rescue Plan, and you'll hear it referred to as ARP dollars. And these are dollars to allow us to afford and infuse dollars into our communities to help with the economic recovery that we're beginning to see and experience. And so we're gonna use ARP dollars because we are clear that these, um, the families that will be able to participate, much like Kaisha said, have been disproportionately impacted by this economic pandemic. And so we'll be using those new federal dollars um, to fund the program. The state of California that also got dollars from ARP um, also created 
a guaranteed basic income program to the tune of about $36 million, if I remember correctly, and the county's program will be about the same. Any other comments, Aaron? anybody wants to raise before I pull another question, comments that you were burning responses you wanted to provide to some of the questions that have been shared already? I think I'll just add briefly to build off of what you know everyone on the panel and you as well, Supervisor Mitchell have been saying is that um, GBI isn't just about giving people money, right? It's about connecting communities. It's about giving folks the opportunity to make their own choices because people know what is best for them. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I think most of these programs are not building around requirements, whether it's work or otherwise, because people's lives take so many different shapes. And you know who's to say whether or not that thousand dollars is going to be used to get you a job, or whether it's going to be used so that you can spend more time with your kids, right? So you can help with homework, so you can right, spend time with your family, or so that you can develop a new skill or take care of your mental health. There are so many great things that people are going to do with this money, and we really can't wait to find out. Someone asked a really important, poignant question: How does this? kind of support, help somebody somebody like me, who's from Skid Row, who lives in supportive services, somebody who gets left out of programs who really needs it. I, I would argue that again, for LA County's program, we are in the process of designing um, what our um, eligibility criteria will be, which segment of the community that we're going to focus on. And I think that's a very valid point. Um, and one that we will absolutely be mindful of, making sure that we are casting a broad net to capture those who are most vulnerable, um, those who, who, who have suffered disproportionately, not only as a result of this public health pandemic, because this pandemic only exacerbated the experiences people living in and at the poverty level have had for many, many years and in some instances, generations. And so I appreciate your comment and we will absolutely be mindful of that. And supervisor, that's a really great opportunity for community partners as well. So maybe if you've been, you know, currently or previously living on Skid Row or any of the other places where people are, are on house currently, you might have a great relationship with the Downtown Women's Center or Skid Row Housing Trust or, you know, TEC or any number of amazing nonprofits that are doing this work as service providers. So if you at that point in your life don't have, a, let's say, a stable address for two years because you're moving through transitional housing, but you have a great relationship with an organization like Skid Row Housing Trust, like the LG LGBT center where you are coming there for maybe other services, counseling, other things every other week, you can um, use them as a conduit to get that financial services to you. Also mm -hmm. being flexible on people who are unbanked and not banked yet, but want to be able to get there. Can we do a Venmo transfer? Can we send you a prepaid debit card, maybe to Skid Row Housing Trust, just making that up so that you're able to get that and that's not a barrier as well. So I think the ability to have that flexibility and open your doors up more to the community rather than treat it like other very traditional government programs that have barriers that might unintentionally shut out someone who's in a more transitional space is one of the really cool opportunities of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, lots of really good questions about, you know, what about this population? What about that population? Grace Barrios is asking about disabled people who are SSI recipients and get $900 a month to cover all of their living expenses or people on CalWORKs who again have to work because we now have a uh, welfare to work pro program in this country. And so people are asking, you know, what about this population? What about that population? And can you talk a little bit about it from a researcher's perspective, um, how we go about and how you will help us go about figuring out who, what population we're going to um, prioritize. I hate to use the term target, the population that we're going to serve. Uh, through who you're, gonna, who you're going to I'm identify. That process. Yes, absolutely. So the key to this really is, you know, starting with community engagement opportunities right here, because it's not just the folks that you see on this call, it's the folks you're on this call with, the 228 people, right, who are in this are going to, you know, play an enormous part in helping the county decide how they're going to drill down and who they're going to say, okay, this is the population, right, whether the population is LA County as a whole or whether it's, you know, more specific. Um, I think from a research perspective, one of the things we always want to make sure is that um, folks are protected when we're looking at them. So we want to make sure that people aren't losing benefits, right, or that they aren't 
you know, in some way, um, ending up worse off because they're participating in a pilot program, right? Our goal is to make sure that everybody is better off at the end of this. Um, so we're gonna work with the county to advise them on essentially what they can do and what they can learn. Yeah, and Grace is such a tremendous advocate. Hey, Grace, I love you. Um, she's been such an advocate for a long time. You can talk about that lived experience of whether it's someone who's maybe visually disabled. So a visual only system is not going to be the only, they're going to need another path, right? So help us get on the front end and solve those kind of things. Or again, trusted community services. So having people involved in this conversation like Grace helps educate us. I agree. Wonderful comment. Someone says, absolutely, there is a systemic disparity. I've worked two and three jobs just to survive the last 20 years. Um, people are asking for help with housing and, and acknowledging that they work full time. Uh, she's a senior and one paycheck away from homelessness. Please keep everyone informed about the program. Is the ultimate goal to have guaranteed basic income implemented on a state or federal level? As I said, in this year's uh, state budget, the state of California passed a program and there was a wonderful piece of history that someone suggested um, that former uh, US Senator Patrick Moynihan actually had a plan or perhaps a bill for a guaranteed basic income program during the Nixon administration. And unfortunately, um, the, the country was catapulted into national turmoil and apparently the issue never came forward. I opened by saying that Dr. King and his Poor People's Campaign platform in the late 60s had a concept about guaranteed basic income. And so, you know, we've come full circle. I think it's wonderful that we've got resources from the federal government that will help create an opportunity for us to all follow suit with um, the visionary mayor of Stockton and the visionary mayor of Compton who started this whole thing for us in California and now cities and now the county will follow. And again, from my perspective, it really is creating a culture shift about people who live in poverty. Um, I, Kaisha, thank you for repping today and being um, a wonderful um, representation about the needs of working families and our goals as parents. You know, I represent 2 million people across LA County. And I have to tell you, everybody wants the same thing. You know, from a district as diverse as Culver City to Carson to downtown, everybody wants the same thing. We all want to be able to grow old in LA County with dignity and raise our children in communities with great schools, uh, um, great parks to play in with public libraries that are equally resourced across the county. Regardless of where you live, everybody wants the same thing for themselves and their family. And programs like, from my perspective, Guaranteed Basic Income is a way in which we can acknowledge that there are communities who have been left behind systemically. And these are, I believe, appropriate ways in which government can step in to provide support, not to replace work, but to acknowledge that far too many are not earning a livable wage working every day, multiple jobs in many instances in LA County. And so this is a way that government can provide support to make sure that Kaisha's new baby has the opportunity that we all want for our own children. Stable, consistent housing in a neighborhood where she feels safe, uh, in a school district that's high quality that will meet her every need. Any closing remarks for folks before we wrap this up? We really thank everybody for carving out an hour and joining with us. Closing remarks, I'll open it up to any of our panelists. I just wanna take my hat off to Kaisha. Um, you are, you have become an amazing ambassador, but you're also an amazing mother and an amazing expert in now financial literacy planning to buy a home, all of this, right? Now you know the answers to the test. So when you're talking to your friend, your coworker, someone at the beauty salon, you know get to share this because you're gonna be the person that they know who knows how to do this. And that has, osmosis is just amazing. So I wanna thank you for your public service by being part of this program. I had a so off to you. I definitely agree. I have literally become a champion. So anyone, like I said, I'm talking about this with any and everyone. Um, and I personally know of other people who are part of the program. So we're sharing stories amongst each other. So if there's something I'm not familiar with, they're letting me know. If there's a, a, a activity that I didn't know about, they're, like I said, they're letting me know. So it is a, a chain reaction. And I'm so grateful to have been granted this opportunity. 
Aaron Suki. Oh, I think all that remains really is to say thank you so much for hosting this and, and putting this together, Supervisor Mitchell. Honestly, it is moments like this that are so exciting as a researcher because this is not about doing you know, data collection on folks, it's with folks. And that is so important to this entire process. So community engagement opportunities like this are really how programs need to be built. And it's phenomenal to see LA County really leading the way. So thank you very much. Ditto. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell and your team for y'all's leadership. We're excited to build towards policy and use your pilot um, along the way to do that. I appreciate that. And I want to thank, we had over 200 people that stayed on for the entire hour with 124 questions. Clearly, we didn't get to all of them, but I thank you all for sharing your perspective. And I hope everyone um, participated today with an open mind. Um, learn something new. Uh, let me say there were lots of questions about what are we doing to help small businesses and others. I would invite you to uh, be a regular uh, um, viewer, if you will, of my website. Um, the county is doing amazing work to provide grants to small business, even to help uh, incubate business, um, um, true small business to survive through this um, economic pandemic. We're doing amazing work around supporting both renters and mom and pop property owners to survive um, um, through this pandemic and drawing down federal and state dollars to help you uh, recover past rents that you are owed. And so go to our website to find out, find out about all of those programs. Um, this is a two-way relationship as a policymaker. You elect me to go uh, to the Hall of Administration, uh, represent you in the county and bring services and fight for you then I need you to meet me halfway to at least go to the website, participate in these Zooms so you can find out about the work we're doing and the kind of resources we're trying to bring to your attention. I am thrilled that so many of you participated, that uh, you are engaged. I hope that you will uh, be a uh, frequent uh, flyer <laughs> that you stop by uh, my website often because that is our primary method of communicating to you what we're doing on a weekly basis on your behalf um, at the County Board of Supervisors. Kaisha, birthday girl Erin, Jamara, Suki, thank you so much. And to my staff who are helping to shape this concept for LA County. Again, this is a work in progress. We got the motion passed to identify the funding and the basic parameters of the program. Now the real work begins where we're going to roll up our sleeves to make sure we get it right for LA County residents. Thank you all. And please uh, uh, stay tuned for future opportunities to engage in policymaking discussions on behalf of We Are the Second District.